This rays of the one light on self-effort too is needed by Swami Kriyananda. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. These past two weeks, we've discussed the need for balancing self-effort with receptivity to divine grace. Both are important in the spiritual life. Passive dependence on grace hasn't the magnetism to attract grace. Boastful self-confidence, however, which closes itself off from the higher divine power is shallow, brittle, and given life's many uncertainties, susceptible to ultimate failure. There is a story in the Bible that illustrates the need to put forth personal effort so as to draw magnetically on the divine power. The story occurs in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 8. But as he went, the crowds nearly suffocated him. Among them was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and who had derived no benefit from anybody's treatment. She came up behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak. As a result, her hemorrhage stopped immediately. Who was it who touched me? Jesus asked. When everybody denied it, Peter remonstrated. Master, the crowds are all around, pressing you on every side. But Jesus said, somebody touched me. I felt power going out from me. When the woman realized that he had, she had not escaped notice, she came forward trembling and fell at his feet and admitted before everyone why she had touched him, adding that she had been instantaneously cured. Daughter, Jesus said, it is by your faith that you have been healed. Go in peace. Self-confidence and self-effort are necessary, as the ignition of a car is necessary to the motor. Of what use the ignition, however, if the motor itself will not work? Wise is he who recognizes the real power in the universe and guides his life by that supreme power. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, the ninth chapter, to those who meditate on me as their very own, ever united to me by incessant worship, I make good their deficiencies and render permanent their gains. Thus, through Holy Scripture, has God spoken to mankind. Oh. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm Darshan, and I'm here together with Naya Swami Bhajana, and we are supported by Maria and by Sabina, technically, and these beautiful musicians, Rachel and Sherry. And we have friends here who chose to come down in the lower temple of Ananda Sisi to hear the service today in English for a change. We do that once a month, so, and hopefully, we'll do more than once a month in the future because, after all, we are not only Ananda Italy, we are Ananda Europe. So thank you for being here. What a powerful reading this is. It made me think of a story in my own life about a cat. You can laugh. <laughs> 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 so um, I moved to this country like 32 years ago about, and I wasn't sure what my life was going to look like. I've never been sure what my life was going to look like. And so I didn't know if I was going to stay in Italy forever, or as it turned out, I have stayed and I'm still here after 30, 32 years. 
Um, there was a point, like a turning point, where I had to make a decision. I was alone, living in a small, I might say, shabby apartment somewhere in the outskirts of the big city of Rome. And I was trying to feel, do I need to go back to Amsterdam where I was born and raised, or shall I, shall I stay here in this country? And then in the evening, I heard um, a little kitty cat meow, meow, outside my window, and I had to make some dangerous moves. And then I saw him there in a the gutter, and he was like this small. <laughs> he was red, and I took him like this. And of course, he was full of fleas and everything. And, uh, and I adopted him, and his name was Dirk. I called him Dirk. That's a Dutch name and also an English name, like the actor Dirk Bogart. Mm -hmm. So I called him Dirk. And um, it was a very particular period, like I said, because I had to make decisions. I was alone. And um, at a certain point, so in the beginning, I wasn't used to having an animal and having to you know, dedicate so much time and effort and energy because a dog requires more, but cats, when they're young, you also need to be with them and you need to take care of them and everything. And, um, but a, a relationship developed between us. It was very special. I became his mother. Like I was wearing a woolen jersey and he was uh, drinking, you know. <laughs> He had adopted me as his mother, and I was, you know, I was touched by that, of course. And um, at a certain point, I was, I remember there was a, a fellow musician, he was Dutch, by the way, and he came to, to see me in that little shabby apartment, and I was talking to him. And I was saying, what shall I do? I don't know, I think I'm gonna move back to, to Holland. Now Dirk, at that moment, was in the other room, okay? As soon as I had said, and then I said, but I don't know what to do with my cat. As soon as I had spoken those words, Dirk came running from the other room. We were in the kitchen. He looked at me. I was standing like this. He made it like a jump and embraced me with one paw on here, one paw on there, like saying, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> So then I said, okay, I still wasn't convinced. And I said, if I find a nice place to live in this city, then I'll stay. And I found something beautiful. Rome is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's like my second city after Amsterdam. And um, so I found a beautiful place and I decided that I was going to give Dirk the two, a full, like a full gift. I was going to not to neuter him, which is a little bit selfish, because you know, if you don't neuter a cat, then he will go out, and then in no time, you will have many little kitty cats everywhere. But I made this decision because I wanted him to, wanted him to be a cat. And at the same time, I wanted him to be in my, you know, human, and I hope, spiritual aura. And so I taught him first, I took him out for walks with the leash, then I went camping with him in the woods, and I just left him, and I was sleeping, and in the morning I would call him, dicky, 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 and then out of the woods he came back to me. I took him here to camp here at Ananda, and he just walked around the, the tent and stayed there. He, first he chased away all the other cats because they were neutered, and so they were not as powerful and strong as he was. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's first get rid of these ones. And then he had the tent and the environment for himself. So, and I even took him on an airplane to Holland. My parents enjoyed, loved him, almost wanted to keep him because he would watch TV with them. <laughs> they were like sitting there and he was just watching TV with them. So, um, and then after a time, I, I, got, I met a lady and we got married and we moved to a little village uh, somewhere outside Rome. And um, Dirk then, so, and we got children, and then Dirk became a little bit more independent from me. He, he could go into his teenage years, you might say. And so, in fact, in no time, that little village, I saw little red cats everywhere, <laughs> kittens <laughs> everywhere, of course. But um, we had a beautiful life together, actually. And I think of it, it's one of the gifts that I feel in my life. It was like a gift from Divine Mother, and maybe she was sending me this little kitty cat. She wanted me to stay in Italy for whatever reason, and I did stay. So um, when I think of that, 
Um, I could feel, and this is what is part of the teachings, what Master says, what the, the scriptures also say, we, we humans, um, worship the angels, we worship the masters, because they, have a, they are a greater power than we are, and we need to connect with them. And likewise, we must, as we are given power, grace, light, upliftment by the angels and by the masters, we should be something similar also for our animals, for animals in general. There is a scene in the um, autobiography where uh, Yogananda visits Mahatma Gandhi, and I think like in the morning they do a special ceremony for, for animals. They send out prayers for all the animals on this fair planet. And so that sort of opens a window of grace in ourselves, like we are taken care of and we, in our, we also take care of who's less strong than we are. But then remains the question, did Dirk make any effort himself to be with me? And there, I'm afraid I have to say, not really, it was his karma. In the autobiography, Vyongananda speaks about the law that governs the karma of animals. And it's a different law. I'm sure it's a beautiful law. After all, it's God's law. And I'm sure that the animals have their own plan of evolution. But they're not at the point where they can make really choices, like we can. Once we are stupid enough to be born a human and with a big ego, then the ego can start making choices. And so when you make a choice, you can ch basically there's only two, two choices that you can make. You're going to assist to love God or, or not to love God. And if you don't love God, then you stay with your ego and you can go on like that for a long time and experience all the ups and downs and, of life. And when you love God, then God takes you with him and unite, unite with him and you, your heart is filled and you become happy again. But then, you know, really happy. So um, this is then reading to, listening to Rachel reading this story about the woman who touched Jesus. I decided to do a little research into that story. And I'd like to read something from you. Look at this. I found this in my book. It's a Bible. <laughs> it's the Bible. And I did some research into how the position of women in the um, Jewish society of those days, because we, I, I sensed and I understood that the suffering of that woman was not just um, physical. Of course, it's terrible when you have hemorrhages, you know, it's difficult enough for most women to have it once a month. So imagine to have it, you know, all the time. It must be terrible as suffering. But then also socially, I knew something that, you know, under Jewish law and also under other laws of other cultures, also in India, a woman who has hemorrhages is supposed to be, or who is in her period, has to, is supposed to be apart from society and everything. And I'll read a few things that I found in uh, the Old Testament. In the book, it says Leviticus. So just to give you an idea, and whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. And whosoever touched anything that she set upon shall wash his clothes and shall bathe himself in the water and be unclean. And it be on her bed, and if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until the even. And it goes on like that. It goes on and on like that. So it's, it's um, a tough rule. And usually rules have a spiritual always, like these rules also come from Moses. But then when you get attached to the rules instead of to the principle, the love of purity that is behind it, then you're going to make mistakes and then you may become cruel, and you may treat women badly. Now, this woman was undoubtedly treated badly. I mean, in a society that is governed by these rules, and you have hemorrhages, so her, her challenge was not, and I'm calling it challenge, I'm not calling it suffering, and I'll explain why later on, but her challenge was not just physical suffering, 
it was solid, it was loneliness, actually. She was expelled from society. She probably, if she was married, her husband could not be with her. If she was not married, then she was probably, she had to be, to stay apart also from her, from other women. It must have been great loneliness. But then, on the other hand, what did she do? What, did, what do we read here when Jesus comes? He comes to, and he is surrounded by a big throng of people. And then she runs over to him. She got, gets out of her isolation, touches his garment, and is healed. Now, this, judge, this um, gesture is not something that is just that happened just spontaneously. She was ready to do this. She must have made her, she must have prepared herself for this. Let's under, try to understand how. Well, there's one saying the master says, he says, that Yogananda says, solitude is the price of greatness. Now, when solitude is imposed on you, you can react in two ways. You can suffer because you are lonely and you, know, you, you feel maybe anger because people are excluding you. And in old times, those women who were lonely often became accused of witchcraft. Okay, so that is like the reaction, the female reaction. Men could also have similar situation. We were talking about the woman now. The female reaction to that kind of exclusion was maybe that she would become angry, develop a lot of anger, maybe try to do black magic, and she was then even worse, accused of witchcraft. Positively, and that was this woman, she probably must have given her loneliness to God. She must have spent a lot of time praying and trying to understand what the universe was trying to give to her, what God was trying to give to her. We must understand that the Jewish spirituality in those days was exceptional because they would, they would recognize only one God. And there was nobody was doing that. The Romans weren't doing that. The Greeks weren't doing that. It was exceptional. And what makes it exceptional, real mono, monotheism for me means that you have one, you need to be happy, you need one inner space of happiness. You need one inner point of reference to be happy that you can always go back to because it's always there for you. You don't need to pray to the wind god and then to the fire god and then to the to God who protects children and then to the God who, protect, who protects marriage. No, there's only one inner truth, one inner state of consciousness, and that is real monotheism. And the Jews had that. So she was a Jewish lady. She had that, you know, by being Jewish, she had that. And she probably, she must have prepared herself and, and have, you know, um, convinced the universe, convinced God to help her in her suffering. So she became probably Maybe she had moments of stillness and of intuition, of superconscious states of stillness. Because then the other thing that is important on the spiritual path is courage. We cannot become spiritual because spirituality is an individual matter. And usually it goes against the mainstream. It goes against fashion. It goes against general public opinions and so on. So when you recognize inwardly a spiritual belonging, a spiritual vibration that belongs to you, you have to make very clear choices. And she probably, she made that choice, must have been. And then Jesus came into that part of town where she was, and he was on his way to heal someone else, by the way. Someone had come to him and says, my daughter is dying, please come to my house. I said, okay, let's go. And a lot of people were following him. And then she felt he was there. And then she made that effort. She, she had courage, she ran, she, you know, she, at that moment she ignored the rules of, I um, mean, the Jewish rule that she had to steer clear of other people, she could not come near people. She ran to him and she touched his garment. And then she was healed. 
Now, touching, touch is an important um, moment in the spiritual life of a person because it says, you know, we give the touch of light. Sri Yukteswar in the autobiography of a yogi touched his Yogananda, his disciple, on the heart, and Yogananda went into ecstasy. It's an important moment. There is also a more worldly sense of touch. For example, my sister, my older sister, like all, was a great admirer of, uh, admirer of Arthur Rubinstein. He was one of the f most famous pianists in the first half of the uh, 19th, 20th century. And he came to Amsterdam to give a concert. And so we all went to hear him. And then, and then my, she said, Mom, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. And he was staying at the Hilton Hotel. And so my mother took him there. And they, she had bought him flowers and so on. And um, what you call that, the people in the hotel, the doorman, porter, yeah, they didn't want to leave her in, you know. And then Rubinstein, the maestro, came himself out of the elevator. She saw my sister, he saw my sister there with, and he was a very charming man. It's like you could listen to his piano playing, you can see that it's all charm, it's beauty. And she came to him, and she, uh, hold on, he walked over to her and said, what's happening here? Well, this lady, this young lady wants to give you some flower. Oh, thank you. And she, he gave her a nice kiss on her cheek. And so when she came back home, we said, I'm not never going to wash this pot. <laughs> So there was not the kind of touch we we're talking about, but just to say that touch, in, whether it's in a worldly sense or in a spiritual sense, it's an important thing. It means something. It means an intimacy. It means when it's spiritual, something very, very deep. What Master says, what Yogananda says, um, is that Jesus' body was filled with cosmic energy, cosmic prana, that is intelligent energy. In fact, I was wondering, because um, here in this um, reading, Jesus says, who touched me, I felt power coming out of me. And in other uh, translations says, I felt virtue coming out of me. And virtue in this case, I would say, is even stronger because it is intelligent cosmic energy. So um, his body was filled with cosmic energy and um, all you needed to do, all I needed to do, and still need to do, in order to, to, to receive that, is to attune ourselves to that, and to have the faith and the trust to, that that works, that if we only need to, to touch his garment, the hem of his garment, and he will fill us with that energy. That's the only self-effort we need to make. It's an effort of attunement, okay? And so when he says to her, daughter, it is by your faith that you have been healed, go in peace. I don't think he meant that she was only healed from her hemorrhages, from her physical ailment. She was healed forever. She probably now ranks upon, among the great masters of the world, of the great saints in the history of the world. You can try to pray to her. You can try to meditate on her presence because um, from that moment on, she already uh, sensed it, intuited it, but when she experienced that healing, she knew, now she knows, that um, her body is made of energy and that in order to grow spiritually, we need energy awareness and we need to learn how to um, use our willpower and our devotion to have high energy, to uplift that energy. And that knowledge um, was hers. It was already hers, but then she experienced it. And then he says, go in peace, meaning basically you're okay now, <laughs> forever. Forever, you don't need to do anything else. Just live in this awareness, take it deeper in you, into your soul, into your heart, and try to Use your energy awareness, the virtue that you have given, taken from, drawn from me. Try to use it intelligently to always live in higher states of awareness. Of awareness. And then also she knew the power of attunement with the higher force, with the guru, with the master. So Yogananda expressed it differently. He said, 
when he was about to leave the body, he said, to those who think me near, I will be near, or I will be near to those who think me near. And that is also an important effort. It was actually my own first real experience with him was, well, the very first, of course, was uh, seeing his picture. And I saw his picture, and uh, some voice in me said, that is my, my guru. It was in Amsterdam in 1981, a long time ago. But then um, it was an American psychologist, actually, who put me in touch with these teachings, and who gave me, he gave me talks. He, he had been to a now, like was a Kriyavan. He lived in Amsterdam, in the downtown Amsterdam on a houseboat, and he gave me talk tapes of Swami's discourse. He gave me the autobiography of a yogi. He gave me Swami's autobiography, The New Path. And then, but I hadn't meditated yet, or not really deeply. I didn't know much about yoga and meditation. But then um, once he said, okay, let's do a, let's do a guided uh, visualization. And so he had me lie down, and then he started, he said a few introductory words. He said, you are now, we are now in the presence of Paramahansa Yogananda. The word Paramahansa, I had no, I couldn't repeat it when he said it. I had never heard that word before. We are now in the presence of Paramahansa Yogananda. He is here, he's talking to you. Tell me what he's telling you. Tell me what he's saying to you. And so my eyes were closed and I went into my own visualization. I was thinking him very, very near. I was thinking him very, very near. And he gave my young heart and my unstable mind and my uncertain self, you know, words of love, words of comfort, saying, you know, it doesn't matter. I know you make many mistakes or you think you make many mistakes. I will love you anyway. I love you anyway. And he went on and went on and went on. And then he came to me and he gave me what I then needed. So I wasn't at all. I had never meditated. I was young. I was, you know. Uh, still experimenting with lots of delusions in life and all those things. But um, he gave me what I needed, and it was a visualization. I was thinking him near in the beginning, but then his eyes were upon me. I was feeling him near. And then it went on, I don't know how long for, but then I, when I came back to normal consciousness, I saw him my friend, the psychologist, was also lying on the floor, and the room was just filled with that beautiful light and presence. And so that, that for me, it took me a while, highlighted for me what, me what Master says when he said, I will be near to those who think me near. And then Krishna says, you know, so beautiful, so comforting, when he says, um, to those who meditate on me as their very own, ever united to me by incessant worship, I make good their deficiencies and permanent their gains. So think him near, but also um, probably what Krishna is saying also is um, meditate go deeper and when we meditate don't think don't feel that we're doing some some exotic powerful technique no we are just reclaiming the fact that he is our very own that that is what we are really and we just throw out or ignore you know every tendency in our heart and in our minds that says differently that identifies ourselves with lesser realities. And so, um, to finish, every meditation is precious. Every self-effort that we make will be made permanent. Even if you, instead of meditating five minutes, no, instead of meditating one hour, you meditated half an hour. Instead of meditating half an hour, you meditated 15 minutes. Instead of 15 minutes, 10 or 5, or even just one minute, if you do that one minute of meditation, Krishna comes and makes that gain permanent. And Yanamata, who was um, 
Yogananda's most advanced woman disciple, just to also finish with a woman, a great soul. She said, every, you know, because it sometimes happens, it can happen even quite often that you sit and you meditate and nothing happens. You don't feel that anything has happened really, you know, just sitting there and, you know, what a, but it's not true. She says, she writes to someone, says, meditate now because you're, you, that gain will be permanent and maybe you're helping yourself, not just now, but maybe you, you will reap the benefit of the meditation that you're doing now, maybe just a one minute meditation, even in some very, very distant incarnation. So we can think now, for example, every time we feel some, you know, spiritual calmness or inner certainty or a moment of joy or a moment of, you know, spontaneous love, we can think of that as something that we have earned by maybe 2,000 years ago, instead of meditating two minutes, we meditated one minute, but nevertheless, we meditated. So let's continue to make efforts and then always remember, if we make that effort, Krishna, God, will make good our deficiencies and permanent our gains. Thank you.